Okay, uh, a few things to do, but first and foremost, want to make sure that everybody is registered in the trading challenge. So this is section 301. And I don't see uh, missing five teams. Let's just see, make sure I have this right. Networks, manage network. Up here there. Oh, okay, you just haven't traded yet. All right, is every team registered? Anybody not registered? Team captain. Here's why this matters. So by Friday of this week, uh, number one, you have to finish your Bloomberg certification, turn it in with the 70% scores on each of the sections. And then number two, you have to be at least uh, 700,000 invested. So starting Friday, you can't have more than $300,000 worth of cash in your account at any point for the rest of the semester. If you do, your team will be disqualified from the competition. And it would be kind of suck to lose 10% of your grade because you forgot to trade. Okay? So by Friday, you need to go buy something. All right. So again, <coughs> um, I'm going to check this on Monday. So you, you can make purchases as through Friday, but make at least, well, you need, most you put in one stock is 200,000. So at least four trades by Friday. And so again, you'll need 10 trades in the first half of the semester running through March 25th. And again, at any point in time, you can't be more than $300,000 in cash. So if you sell it, then replace it with something else, all right? And I might give you like a one day grace period. So if you sell it on Monday, you can buy something else on Tuesday, but you can't sit on cash, okay? No matter whether the market's going up or down, can't sit on cash. You've got to keep trading or at least keep the, mark, the money invested in the marketplace. All right, questions about any of that? Got some trading to do? So again, your team captains can either get to the screen by typing in IDEA, I-D-E-A, or TMSG. Those are the two ways that you can get to the trading. You can't get there through PRTU. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so the other thing I want to talk about today so we're going to eventually get to homework three, but before we get to homework three, I want to talk about homework two, which is the EIC assignment we did on Nike, All right? So while we're getting ready to talk about homework two, I want to alert you also to the three group projects that are coming up. So in Elms, if you look at your grading here, you'll see that there are three group projects worth 5% of your semester grade each. The first one is coming up on, it's coming up on February 24th. Uh, it's assignments. These are these assignments down here under the group assignments, group projects one, two, and three. Okay? So the way it's gonna work is that for each of those three five-point group assignments, you will do an in-class presentation of five to ten minutes. Okay? So on February 24th, uh, there will be six or seven presentations in each of the sections. All right? And the presentation will be on EIC. All right? So just like we're talking about Nike's EIC individual assignment, you'll do a group presentation on the EIC of a company that I will give you in approximately two weeks. All right, and that's going to be for five percent of your semester grade. All right, you'll do another group project <coughs> on March 11th on the historical analysis, and you'll have to present that in five or ten minutes for five percent of your grade. You'll do a third group project on April 15th, again five to ten minutes, and that'll be on the valuation. All right, and then the last week of class, you'll do a 15-minute presentation on all four sections on a company that you'll be working on for the last month of the, of the semester, okay? But what the TA's recommended, and we're, gonna, we're doing it this semester, is rather than waiting to the final week of class to do presentations, we're gonna practice the presentations for each of the sections earlier in the semester for grades. That's gonna be important to you because the other thing that we're implementing is everybody has to present in each one of these group three projects, but you can't present more than once. So, let's say you have six people on your team, okay? 
group project one, two people present. They will present, and that'll be the grade for your entire team. Group project two, the two people that presented on group project one can't present on group project two or three. They're done. Two other people will present for group project two. Then, group project three, the final two people who didn't present on one or two would have to present on three. So, everybody has to present across those three projects. You can only present one time across those three projects. And whoever presents is doing the grade on behalf of your entire team. Okay? And part of the reason why I'm doing that <clears throat> is that it was apparent to me the last couple semesters that one or two people were doing all of the work for the presentations. So the TAs made the suggestion that it would be better if we force people to split up the presentations. So that is what we are implementing differently this semester versus what we had done in prior semesters. So everybody's going to present. If you got stage fright, get over it. Okay. <clears throat> now, again, I'm a professional speaker. I, I actually really am. And I'm used to doing presentations all the time. I know you are not. <clears throat> so. If you need to use like you know reading notes and cards and, and to do the presentation, that's fine. Not going to grade you 100% on style points, right? You got to get the content right. But as a team, you're going to all put it together and then you're going to split out the presentation, and you're all going to participate in the final presentation, final week of class as well. So that's coming up. All right. So <clears throat> as we practice EIC today, this is just a good dry run. It'll be the last dry run before you do this presentation as a group in two weeks. So, EIC for Nike. So the first part of EIC for Nike, NKE, is you should have gone to Nike, you should have gone to RV, you should have gone to Markets and Beta, and you should have had a screen that looks something like this. So what would be the answer to the E part of the equation? How would you answer the E? With the industry and the Nike sensitivity. What you guys say? <coughs> yeah. Um, I think that based on how the industry is asking for industry sensitivity, if you can do the same thing with the industry sensitivity, you can keep it down to ten years in the average company. Um, and the all percent less sensitive and then the Nike beta being twenty eight percent makes it seem really less sensitive than it is at all. Okay. Now, obviously, my day is going to be slightly different than yours because the time that you did it, you had 0.88, I got 0.89. But the short answer is that's a great answer. Okay, it's exactly what I'm looking for. She used the numbers. She basically had the right idea, directionality. It was very clear to the point. Like that's the type of answer that would be helpful, whether in the presentation or in the paper. So that's what we're looking for as a technical answer for the E. Okay, questions about that? Easy peasy. But here's the next piece. What about the economy itself? Like, is anything going to happen to the economy based on your other analysis? Should we be concerned about the economy? We just talked about the impact of Nike, but what about the economy itself? Because if anybody went to F ECFC, right now there's a one in three chance of recession. 30% probability. And obviously, we're seeing some scary headlines. So, is that something we should be talking about with Nike? Should be, could there be a short term downturn? Anybody talking about that in their answer? I see nodding heads, so the answer would be yes. So, what did you say? Um, so, I talked about <coughs> both the probability of recession as well as the fact that real GDP. That's okay. That's, that's good analysis. And that could actually be more detrimental to a company like Nike and the, the, the uh, athleisure industry as well. Uh, I didn't validate this fact, but somebody in one of the earlier sections said that uh, Nike has closed half its stores in China right now. Did you guys hear that? So it is true. That could be a problem for Nike as well uh, and other retailers in general uh, if people are having trouble buying them. 
Um, you know, anecdotally, what's not happening in Barcelona this week? Something big was supposed to happen in Barcelona, yeah. There was like some big conference and I think like Apple one pulled out of it. Yeah, it's the Mobile World Conference Center with all the mobile phone companies show up once a year to launch all their do tech and negotiate deals. Nobody go. Nobody went because of the coronavirus. That's going to have implications throughout the supply chain. Like all the major companies pulled out. Matter of fact, if, if you want to see the impact on Apple, go to apple.com, try to make any customization and buy any custom computer. You'll see that it'll take a month to get it because there's literally nobody in China to make it. Because China has not allowed Foxconn's workers to get back into the factories to actually make the products. And not just Apple products. So you think about chipsets and others, like the tech industry right now is paralyzed because of their supply chain. I mean, just anecdotally, I was supposed to do some work later this semester for a company called AstraZeneca in Beijing. That got canceled. <clears throat> and then they were going to move it to San Francisco. That got canceled because nobody could leave China to go to San Francisco. So I'm just saying, like, I, you know, just business travel is being impacted, companies are being impacted, stores are closing. So short term, I, I don't know how much this is going to affect Nike, but it probably is, and just the athleisure industry. Um, long term, two to three years out, is this a blip? Or are we heading towards a global recession? Anybody try and address that one? Is this just a blip? Because eventually this is going to be an important question when we do our valuation forecast. But hopefully, I mean, if you believe the ECFC data that I'm looking at right now, it is a blip. And we're seeing some tepid growth going forward. But nonetheless, uh, so it's probably more of a short term thing than a longer term thing. And in either way, in the longer term, Nike should be somewhat insulated by having the lower beta that we just talk, talked about. Okay? All right. Next, I. RV. Custom. Spread. Is this an attractive industry? What'd you say? Is this an attractive industry and does Nike have competitive advantage? Yeah. Yes, sir. <coughs> yes, it's an uh, attractive industry because the ROIC 30.2 is already greater than the last 7.86. And Nike has a competitive advantage because its spread is 23 inches greater than the spread of the industry is 17 inches. Uh, almost correct. You actually read the Nike spread for the industry spread. There's a lot of data in that screen. But, uh, but yeah, the industry, the 25.35 versus the 8.03. You, you said the 30.37, whatever was the industry. Just read the wrong numbers. But the point is, yes, the, the spread of the industry, 25.35 greater than 8. Nike competitive advantage because its spread of 33.9 minus 7.86 is greater than that. So great idea. Just read the wrong numbers. Okay? So, again, this screenshot of those two. Turn them in. This is the easy part. All right, now we get into the five forces. So, all right, as we do our five forces analysis, what about the five forces explains this attractive spread? Why is this industry attractive? What do you guys say about that? Why is this? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think the, like one of the five forces is the spread in the metric, and there's an extremely low spread in the metric, or I guess put another way, a very high variability in the industry as a whole because like you have to build up a Yeah, and you had to get on the retail shelves. So that generally has made the industry historically attractive, and Nike has benefited by that. Okay? So higher barriers to entry currently. What else? I did say um, like the spread of substances is fairly low. Um, people are just going through it not based on like price, but based on the fact that they have to get under on the right mm -hmm. 
So that also probably spills over into the rivalry, which is, because in the earlier classes, people said there's a lot of rivalry, but you'll notice that the rivalry is not about price. Like these people don't usually compete on price. Like if anybody's gone to Lululemon to buy their yoga pants, I don't think they're cheap, All right? Same thing, if you go buy some Nike shoes, good luck trying to find any pair of shoes less than $100. I mean, basically these companies, even Under Armour, I mean, these are, these are expensive clothing and I think that they compete on other factors, but they generally don't like to compete on price. And that's, that tends to mean the rivalry is not as intense as we think it is. It's more of an oligopoly. So I think it spills over in those, part, those parts currently, which helps the industry. What else helps the industry? Buyer power? Do we have a lot of power over these guys? Or at least are we exercising it? say that but also think about the sports market do the individuals really have choices if you work from a sports team I mean if you're you're in a sports program you're wearing Nike gear because the school signed it as opposed to or a professional team because the professional team signed it, you're kind of you're kind of forced into those deals now there's some individual basketball players etc but those are exceptions for most people I, I think that has helped them by essentially taking some of the buyer power away from the individuals and Matter of fact, something was mentioned in the last class, uh, performance is also very important as well. Like Nike, it has a lot of innovation. Matter of fact, Nike's running shoes are actually helping runners set world records. I've always been reading about that. To the point that they really are performance enhancing products. And, and that, in a way, makes it harder for other people to break into this. In fact, somebody was saying in the last class, I don't know if this is true or not, but they said that the Olympic team pretty much was gonna force people to wear Nikes. Is that true? Just nodding heads. So again, in a way, how much choice do we have? It may or may not be as much as we think, but either way, they're exploiting it. All these factors generally favorably to help them make pretty high rates of return, okay? Substitutes aren't really much of a threat. We don't have as much buyer power. Plus, there's a lot of demand. This is a very fast growing market. There's only five or six major players. A lot of demand relative to the supply, so it's easy for them to, to sell a lot without having to really fight for each other for market share because the pie is growing so dramatically. You know, just a good example of this is how athleisure is encroaching into just daily wear for the workforce. I mean, I'm wearing a, a hockey jersey to, to class today. You know, first of all, 10 years ago, I can't imagine in a work environment that I'd wear a hockey jersey to a work environment. And today it's almost, you know, nobody even notices. It's become the norm. I mean, you walk around Wall Street, very rarely do you see people dressed up formally. Even Wall Street has gotten much more informal than they used to. And, and so I say that, like, that's good for the athleisure industry because to some of you, they have been a substitute for traditional clothing and there's been a lot of demand. And that demand, I think, has benefited the industry and minimized the price rivalry so far, okay? It's been hard to break into these supply chains you guys talked about. And the barriers to entry to get in this business are relatively high. The suppliers don't seem to have much power. I said, like, the suppliers have a lot of power? Like, who are the suppliers? The companies like Nike. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if they're doing it because they get parts like cotton or rubber and so on. Like, things that are pretty easy to supply. Yep. So, you really have to go to Wall Street with a company to get the Nike that they sell. Yeah. Like, where's your, where are your clothes made? Like the clothes that you're wearing, the Nike clothes. Where? It's under your China, but increasingly it's not even China anymore. Yeah. Like Vietnam, the Burmese stuff, like stuff. Yeah, and uh, Bangladesh is another huge marketplace. India. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I work with a company called PVH, they're starting to source clothes out of Africa. Ethiopia is becoming the next hot destination. Ethiopia is the new Bang Bangladesh. Right. I was talking to one of the suppliers. They told me they're paying like eight cents an hour in Ethiopia uh, for wages because China's getting too expensive. Because uh, China's going more tech savvy, 
And so wages are rising in China, so what used to be in China is now moving to Africa. And so Africa is actually the next hotbed for outsourcing because you got a lot of cheap labor in Africa right now. So essentially the suppliers, because it's contract manufacturers, are being played off against each other. And essentially the, the, these, these players are benefiting from that because suppliers don't really have a lot of power. And it's, it's relatively easy to make this stuff in other parts of the world, assuming you can get it at scale. But nonetheless, they're not exhibiting a lot of power over these players. So very attractive industry. Here's what matters. Is this going to change in five years? Is this fundamental spread going to be about the same? Is, are any of the forces going to go against them? Or is this going to maintain similar forces and a similar spread? Because this is the more important question. Yeah. I think it's going to stay relatively the same because people are really becoming aware of a healthy lifestyle and kind of adapting to that. So I think as that And happens, athleisure helps that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That, that's a prime example of like equipment that people would want to buy to kind of motivate them and whatnot. So I do think it'll kind of continue that way. Okay, so our lifestyle choices favor this industry, so that should still help them with the, the less rivalry, more supply-demand balance. Okay, good, what else? In five years. So he's arguing that nothing's really gonna change and this industry is still very attractive. You could have a different opinion. This one's harder because we're talking about the future, yeah. Okay, so here's something that I would suggest keeping your eye on, just in, in the real world. Has anybody here used the drop? The drop, or heard of the drop by Amazon? The drop, Amazon. Shop the drop. Here we go. So here's what Amazon is doing. Amazon is taking influencers or just young upstart stylists, fashion stylists. They're showcasing them. They give you a 24-hour window. You buy their clothes, and then contract manufacturers do build-to-order custom clothing to you, ship to your house in less than a week <coughs> at prices of like $40. $50. So basically, without the super brands, you're getting brand clothing by influencers at much lower cost. So going back to, it's hard for individuals to access the supply chains. Amazon is actually allowing influencers to access the supply chain and bypass the traditional brands at much lower cost and disrupting this space, kind of like H&M and Zara did with the traditional retailers. Stuff like this is starting to pop up on the internet. I don't know how well this is going to take off for the next few years, but when you guys talk about supplier power, this is something to keep your eye on if you see a change in this industry. I don't know if you're going to want to shop this way. Again, most people even here haven't even heard of this yet, but this is something that's an experiment. Another experiment that I find to be interesting that's actually doing really well, a company called Stitch Fix. Does anybody here use Stitch Fix? Has anybody heard of Stitch Fix? So what is Stitch Fix? Stitch oh, Fix. That That's Stitch yeah. Fix, exactly. That, they, they popularize that. So the idea is you basically tell them what your preferences are, and then they curate and send you clothes. And they'll start out with five, and everybody that I talk to that anecdotally <coughs> keeps it. Like, you return it for free, but they basically are like, wow, this is actually stuff I would wear, and then they wear it. And usually they keep about 80% of the stuff that's sent, and then the more they send you, the better they know you, and it just gets even worse. Because right? then they just send you more stuff that you just buy. It just kind of shows up. So <clears throat> there's been riffs on this. But, but again, it goes back to not the traditional brands, but others, the, the database companies, that are basically knowing your preferences and then personalizing clothing uh, more towards your lifestyle. 
Um, so that's just a, another you know, interesting company to watch. But I, I like to call it the YouTubization, if that is a word, of retail. It's, it's really the ability to co-create is something that's relatively new. The tools are becoming more accessible to generally the, the more population. And I think that that could change that entry barrier issue that we talked about. Because now, smaller companies are able to access some of these supply chains, get distribution power through companies like Amazon, and threaten some of the retail distributions historically. So whether or not in five years that's really going to challenge the companies like the Nikes or the Under Armors or the Lululemons, I don't know. But it is something to be, you know, to think about as a potential possibility and a threat that these companies have to face. Okay? So that would make an argument that the ROICs could start to come down. Still be positive, maybe less so than they are today. Don't know. And again, this is where scenarios can come in, differences of opinion. But where this is going to matter is when we get to our valuations and how we view the future forecast for companies like Nike. Competitive advantage. Why does Nike have a competitive advantage? What's, what do you think their real source is? Do you want to? Yeah, why is Nike doing better than their, their peers? I think our brand reputation that I've built over the past um, so many years, like they have over 50 plus years uh, since their founding, so they have a lot of um, you know, uh, brand reputation that they've been able to build over the Yeah, and, and they have a lot of tastemakers and, and athletes. I mean, from Simone Biles to LeBron James and, and others are in their, you know, stable, and I think that really helps them to pretty much every major athlete. They're at every major event. I mean, they just got tremendous brand, you know, recognition. What else do you think drives their competitive advantage? Do you think they're pretty innovative? I mean, they actually are innovating through technology in this industry, and particularly Nike. And that innovation is, is paying off with better performance for the athletes. And, and so whether or not you actually need the performance, the idea that you, you feel that your clothes will give you better performance and you're doing athleisure, it's actually benefited Nike. And I think that's also led to their competitive advantage. And don't necessarily underestimate all the lockup deals that they have with sports teams and leagues and other things. That that kind of locks them in to using the Nike brand and that tends to help them as well. All right. So that can change in five years? Is Nike still going to have an above industry spread in five years? Okay. That would be our opinion. We'd explain it why. EIC. All right, questions about EIC? Relatively straightforward. All right, let's talk about the core of homework three coming up for Monday. So everything I'm about to explain to you, if you didn't watch the video on Monday on economic conversion, you're going to be completely lost. So you have to watch that video. And I'm assuming that you will watch the video if you haven't already, right? But uh, lecture note three is in the file section. And it's related to what was on the video. But I'm not going to repeat what's in the video unless you ask very specific questions. But basically, what this, the gist of this class and what's truly unique or different about what we're doing <clears throat> is we are tying financial statements to Medigliani Miller, the one, two, three, four process we talked about in the video, right? And very specifically, we're taking the cash flows and we're breaking them into what's called operating and non-operating cash flows, right? And what that means is operating cash flows are recurring cash flows associated with selling the product or service. It's your normal running of your business. Non-operating cash flows our cash flows have nothing to do with sales. Okay, they're one-offs, they're not operating by definition, they have nothing to do with sales. So what's important about this approach in this class is that everybody else leaves these lumped together. They co-mingle the operating and the non-operating cash flows together. What we're doing, and almost no one else does this, okay, this is only taught here, Wharton and by McKinsey. 
is we're separating out the operating and non-operating into two buckets because we're going to forecast those buckets independently. And because of present value, we'll add them back together. And I believe that that will lead to a better valuation and a better understanding of the, of the models. But the problem is, since nobody else does it that way, all the data, including in Bloomberg, has to be changed. That's part of your homework assignment. And a good representation is on this slide. Okay. These are the two ROICs. This is what I'll call traditional ROIC, which is also the way Bloomberg calculates ROIC and the ROIC you've used on your assignments. And going forward after homework three, this is the way we're going to start calculating our class. The major difference is when they do traditional ROIC, they take EBIT, which includes both operating and non-operating profits. And they divide by all the assets which includes non-operating and operating assets commingled. So it's a total return on the business. It's a return in the debt and equity of the business. Okay? I'm not saying that's not the return that the business is using, but here's the problem. When I value, I, I care about the forecasted incremental dollar. The problem with the approach that everybody else uses is in the textbooks is that all that non-operating stuff repeats itself when we value the company going forward. And that can mess up your valuation because the whole point of non-operating assets, they have nothing to do with sales. And if I keep taking things that have nothing to do with sales and I say they grow with sales, then I may not truly understand what's happening with the business. So it's not that we're ignoring them. What we're going to do is we're going to value them separately and we're breaking them out separately as opposed to leaving them bundled together. So what we are going to do is we are going to take, instead of the EBIT, we're going to take the operating profit divided by the operating assets, operating ROIC. We're then going to have a non-operating profit divided by a non-operating assets, non-operating ROIC. The weighted average of the two is what Bloomberg would call the ROIC. Okay? And that approach, which you're going to hate, because you, you had to convert all this stuff, will give us cleaner and better valuations. And that's essentially what homework three is partially about. So homework three is basically going to be taking financial statements, downloading them, converting them into the economic format without a write-up, and then turning it in. By the way, that's midterm one. The only difference between homework three and midterm one is midterm one, you'll do it during class, you'll have 75 minutes, and it'll be 5% of your semester grade. Okay? You're going to do that in about three weeks. So midterm one, you're going to do it in 75 minutes. This one might take you a little bit more than 75 minutes. And so if you struggle with this, I will strongly encourage you to take advantage of the TA's office hours. Right? Because tomorrow, Thursday, the TA's have office hours. And if you go back to Elms, pretty much all day. And you can go to any of the TA's. And so again, the advantage of all the TAs for this class is the four TAs all took this class, all had to do what you're doing, and generally understand this approach. Okay, so they start out nine to eleven tomorrow, then twelve to two, three thirty to five thirty, five thirty to seven thirty. Okay, so if you're struggling, take advantage of the TAs. Go to them; they can help you. All right. That being said, watch the video. Because you don't watch the video, you have no idea what we're talking about. But let me give you an example of why this matters. So let's say we're valuing Apple. We're trying to do Apple computer. AAPL, US equity, we go to RV. Custom spread. All right, and then we do our thing, is this an attractive industry? And the answer is gonna be yes, it's an attractive industry. And does Apple have competitive advantage? Yes, Apple has competitive advantage using the numbers that we just talked about in the IC. Okay, so here's the point for valuation. Apple's ROIC, as of the latest filing, is 25.6%. Translation, for every dollar of investment, Apple generates 25.6 cents of cash basically what ROIC means, right? 
because as I'll mention in the video, what basically our McKinsey's approach is, rather than forecasting numbers, we forecast our ROIC, which is a proxy for free cash flow. So it's just an easier way to forecast free cash flow. So basically it's a proxy for free cash flow, 25.6 cents of cash for every dollar. All right. So if Apple were to grow a dollar, spend another dollar to grow a dollar, another dollar of investment will lead to 25 cents more of cash. If you did that, you will undervalue Apple. Because even though that's their ROIC, it's not the operating ROIC when they sell an iPhone. Okay? The operating ROIC when they sell an iPhone or a computer or an AirPod which is a custom field that you don't have in your account, which you will after this next homework assignment, op ROIC is 350%. When Apple invests the next dollar, they generate $3.50 of cash profit, not 25 cents per dollar of investment. See, that's what's misleading, right? And the reason why it's misleading is because the reason they only earn 25%, not 350%, is calculated in that calculation is Apple's cash balance sitting in their balance sheet doing nothing. So when they have $100 billion of cash sitting in Ireland that they don't want to bring to the US to pay taxes on, they make 25%. But what I'm telling you is to sell the next iPhone, they don't need to go borrow another $100 billion of the cash to sell another $100 billion of the iPhones. That doesn't make any logical sense. Yet that's what you would do if you use Bloomberg ROIC in your valuation, is you would assume all those non-operating assets, just a bunch of cash sitting on their balance sheet, would have to be reborrowed to sell the next iPhone. And I'm telling you, as simple as it sounds, this is what people don't do in the textbooks. This is what people don't do in the real world. This is what I'm gonna teach you how to do in this class, which is why I think you get a better valuation. Because, and I'll just be practical, how does Apple make this ridiculous rate of return? Because this, is a $1,400 iPhone <laughs> that I bought last year. All right, I'm one of the, the, the Apple more, and I'm the sheep, okay? I bought the new Big XS, fully loaded, <coughs> paid, the, paid the full freight, okay? Actually, I financed it like a car for two years, $70 a month, but, but basically it's a $1,400 phone, okay? So here's the point, who made this phone? I'll give you a hint, it's not Apple. Who made this iPhone? company called Foxconn. It's a Chinese company based in China. Okay? They made this phone, they sold it to Apple for $400. Okay? Foxconn hired 300,000 people. They have hundreds of millions of dollars of, of assets, well, Chinese assets, less tens of millions of dollars of assets sitting in China. All these plants, all these people, they got dorms, they got machines, they make the phone, they sell it to Apple for $400. <coughs> Apple sells it to me for $1,400, pockets the thousand, right? You know where all the inventory sits? Not in the Apple stores. Apple's got four days of inventory total as an entire company. There's a reason why when the new iPhone comes out, you order it one to two weeks before you get it by mail because they basically say, hey, Foxconn, ship direct from Foxconn to you. Foxconn's holding all the inventory. Apple holds very little inventory. That's why you can't get a build to order Mac right now because Foxconn has to build to order and ship the Macs overnight. That's the problem with Foxconn is right now, those 300,000 workers can't go to the factories because the Chinese government won't let them because of the virus. So literally, Apple is shut down globally. They can't make any phones, they can't make any computers, they're completely screwed by this virus, by the way. This is they're not the only tech company. But that's the point. That was Apple's genius, is let Foxconn make all the investment. So Apple has very little investment. So that's the point. When they sell the phone for next to nothing, they're making $1,000, 300%. So that's why I said, like, we actually undervalue Apple if we assume they're only making 25%, because the problem is they're like Johnny Depp in his cocaine movie was that movie Blow? Have you ever seen the movie Blow? There's a point in the movie where they had like boxes of cash and they were they had so many boxes of cash they ran out of places to put it. That's Apple. Like they're so busy counting their cash 
from the phones. They have nowhere to put all this cash. They can't pay it out fast enough. So it's a nice problem to have. So I go back to, that's why they're making so much valuable. That's why their market cap is $1.42 trillion. It's not because they make a 25% ROIC, because they're making 350% of these phones because they take no investment. The Chinese are taking all the risk and they're making all the profits. Okay, so whether or not that continues is a different story, but this is why we need to understand what's really happening with the company. Otherwise, we really don't understand the valuations. Okay, so how do we get here? You need to create operating ROIC as a custom formula. In Bloomberg, the other half of homework three is to create this as a custom formula. There's two places, only two places in Bloomberg, you can create custom formulas. One is RV, the other is EQS. I also want you to use the equity screening tool, EQS. The equity screening tool is powerful because there's 1.23 million equities in the database. You can search on any criteria that you want, which would be very helpful for your Bloomberg trading competition, by the way. Okay? So up here in the upper left-hand corner, these are the screens that you can save. But above the screens, there's a box called formula. This is where you can create a custom formula. So you click on the word formula to build a custom formula. Now here will be all your custom formulas. It will be blank. As you add them, they will come in. So in the homework assignment, do Monday, the first part of the homework assignment is you got to create operating ROIC. But to create operating ROIC, you have to create these other custom fields. The first custom field is no plat. Okay? Then you're going to do operating cash. Then you're going to do operating working capital. Then you're going to do operating invested capital. And then no plat divided by operating invested capital is operating ROIC. So you have to create these four custom fields to create the fifth one. And the nice thing is once you've created one custom field, you can use that custom field to build other custom fields. Okay, so do it in this order. All right, so let's start out with no plat. Now, no plat is not the same as no pat in Bloomberg. Operating invested capital in Bloomberg is not the same as the custom operating invested capital that we're talking about. So be very careful. Don't say, oh, I can just cheat and use the Bloomberg fields. You'll get a zero for the assignment. All right? And by the way, going forward, we're going to use operating ROIC again and again and again the rest of the semester. So you got to get this one right. Okay? So the grading is kind of ticky-tack, meaning you have to get the exact right operating ROIC as part of the assignment, because that's the only way I know that you did the formulas right, because I need you to be able to use this formula again. So we all got to do it the same way. So let's do no plan. Here's the formula. Go back to Bloomberg. OK. This is where you type in the formula. But since you don't know the formula fields, you can put the, the friendly name in Bloomberg, and it will help you. So left paren, field, operating income, not EBIT, is the first one we're using for our version of NOPLAT. So type in operating income. And I'll say, which one do you want? For purposes of this assignment, we're going to use latest year. When you hit enter, that is dollar sign IS033 colon Y. That's the database field, which you probably, unless you're a you know Uber hacker, wouldn't know. And the colon Y is the colon year, means last reported year. Two years ago, Y minus one, next year, Y plus one, et cetera. But Bloomberg will give it to you when you chose latest year. Okay? Now, I'll continue on. And I'm going to multiply this by left paren. 1 minus, go back to the field, the effective tax rate. Start typing in EFF. Select it, it'll say which effective tax rate do I want as of the latest year. Hit enter. And I want to divide that, you can see over here in the formulas, by 100. because the tax rate's going to show up at like 30, okay? And I need to be like 0.3, so divide by 100, right? 
right paren, right paren, then hit save or save and use. When you save, it's going to give you a pop-up box and it's going to say up to 13 characters, what do you want to name the custom field? Okay, so you will call it no plat. All right. Now I already have a no plat, so since I'm doing this again, I'm going to call it no plat 30120. Okay, but this is basically no plat, and hit name. And then two things are going to happen. Number one, it's going to show up in the list to the left. Assuming that uh, my terminal is frozen. Why did my terminal freeze? Oh, there it goes. All right. So then, once you save it down here, there's the friendly name. So you can verify the friendly names again. Bloomberg will show you the friendly names you type them in. That's the actual database field codes, which you don't need to know. Now, if you want to know, you could. But since you don't need to know it, the friendly name is your old back down here. That's your formula. Okay? So you're going to keep doing this until you get down to an op ROIC. Once you do that, you're going to come back here and you're going to start doing the screening criteria. <coughs> so the first criteria is it has to be in the S&P 500. So add criteria SPX, S&P 500 index, hit enter, boom, 505 companies. Now you might say, gee, why are there 505 companies in a 500 company index? And the answer is some companies like Alphabet slash Google are dual listed, class A, class C shares. So five companies have dual listed shares. So there's 500 companies, 505 potential stocks you can buy to buy 500 companies. Right? So that's the S&P 500. Then we're going to do our criteria. So the criteria for the homework says, I want companies that have an operating ROIC greater than 20%. So I'll then add my criteria, operating ROIC, which you don't have yet, as a custom field, we hit enter, greater than 20. 505 companies become 130. So 130 of the 500 companies, the S&P 500, basically had an operating ROIC greater than 20% last year. Next criteria, I want revenue growth Year over year. I want companies that have a year over year revenue growth rate greater than 15%. I believe is the next criteria. 15%. Now, you didn't see this, but in the screen, there was an and or an or. Okay? You have to think about this logically. So if it's an and, it applies both criteria. If it's an or, it applies either criteria. So you can actually start building some pretty custom logic here for how you want to do this. But I wanted an and to further screen. So now I'm down to 26 companies in the S&P 500 grew faster than 15% and had an operating ROIC greater than 20 last year. All right. And my third criteria for your homework assignment, add criteria, is has a bull beta, not a regular beta, but a bull beta, greater than two. And that's an and criteria as well. Let's add that criteria. So I'm down to five. That is the solution to your homework assignment. Okay? Does everybody know what a bull beta is? It's actually a thing, as opposed to a beta beta. There's actually also something called a bear beta. So basically, a bull beta is the beta only on up days of the market. So it calculates beta, excludes all the down days. So it says, only when the market is up, what happens to the stock? So when the market goes up, 
then bull bait is a two, meaning they are the ones that go the fastest when the market is rising. Bear bait is the opposite. Bear beta excludes all the up days and only looks at the down days. When the market goes down, what only happens when the market goes down to my stock? Okay, so traders will use bull and bear beta more so than they'll use regular beta because if I'm thinking about, okay, this is the bull market, what companies generally do better in a bull market? Bull beta. Okay, because the stocks are rising, <coughs> the stocks tend to be more rising up in the higher markets at a faster rate. These are the five companies. Okay, so who are the five companies? See results. File, take screenshot, save, homework assignment. Yes? This part you don't usually use RV. Okay? For this homework. However, there's another half to this homework where I'm going to give you a company and you're going to do a spread based on operating ROIC. So you will have to go back to the RV screen and do an operating ROIC WAC industry average and submit that as well. Use that in the custom and then you just say op ROIC as opposed to uh, Bloomberg's traditional ROIC. It will pop up because anything you save is a custom field, you can use an RV. For some bizarre reason, you can't use custom fields in FA. Okay, so custom fields are not allowed in FA. I don't know why, but they are allowed in RV and EQS. All right, so again, back to the assignment. The reason why I also want you to do it in the RV is because here uh, we're going to check to make sure you have the right operating ROIC. And just the, you can do the EIC assignment again. Okay? It should be easy. Just quickly take a screenshot. You're not going to write it up. That part you're not writing up. So you're not doing any write up this week. That's the easy part. But you have to do the conversion. You have to build the formulas right. You got to get the screen right and the two screenshots right. That's what you're turning in. So you're going to turn in three files. You're going to turn in the RV screenshot, you're going to turn in the EQS screenshot, and you're going to turn in the converted Excel file with the four new tabs. The four different states, TII, TFI, EP, CFI. Balanced. Very important to balance <laughs> those tabs. Okay, that's for Monday, and we'll go over that on Monday. Okay. This part shouldn't be that hard, creating the custom fields. It'll take you five, ten minutes if you just follow the, the scripts on there. Okay, add a terminal. You could probably do it even right now. All right, but uh, <clears throat> the conversion will take you a little bit longer. You definitely will need to watch that video in order to do the conversions or read the book, but the book is a lot more confusing. The video will probably help you. Okay, all right, questions about any of this? All right, so I will give you the balance of class time. You're welcome to work on this. Remember, your teams have to start making some investments by Friday, so make sure you do that. Bloomberg certification is due Friday. Make sure you turn in those screenshots, so in 70%. Just very clear on Bloomberg, because I got a question about this. You can only take the quiz once per module. So if you score less than 70%, you have to create a new account. Now, you don't have to take all the modules again. You just take that module, but you need a new account in order to basically get to take the quiz again if you score less than 70%. So you may have to turn in more than one screenshot to show your certification. Yes? When you say the quiz, does that actually mean you have to take four questions? That's what the results are? Yeah, and the multiple choice. Not, that comes with. not like the knowledge check in between? Everything that's within that section, you're, you're answering, you have to get 70% right. And unfortunately, as you probably quickly realized, you can't just skim. Like, if you skim, you're not going to get 70%. You're going to have to actually read their stuff. That's intentional on their part. Yes? Um, what's the estimated total time at the end uh, to complete the entire terminal or the course? Four to six hours. Four to six hours. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to get, like, five hours. I mean, it's, it could take longer to take more time, but yeah, generally four to six. 
But here's the other point. You can take it online. So remember, you have that as long as you use the uofd.edu email address. And somebody asked about this too. Like if you have to create a new account, you're not creating a new terminal account, you're creating a new BMC account because they're actually two separate accounts. So you can actually create a new one online. You just have to use a different uofd.edu address. You can't use your own. It won't, those are unique in Bloomberg. So you'd have to create it using some other UMD address friend or something like that and turn it in. <laughs> but nonetheless, that's due Friday at five. Trade 700,000 minimum into, out of cash and into equities by end of day Friday. I'll check that on Monday, okay? And then make sure you complete homework three by Monday, 10 a.m., a lot coming up. All right, if you have any questions, I'm around. I recorded this, I'll be posting this on YouTube, so today's class is available online shortly, and otherwise, I'll be here for questions.